another chance for you to read along with the gospel reading this morning. Uh, remember uh, that you can sign up to participate in worship, read scripture, offer the children's message. Uh, sign up Genius is set up or just email Wendy or me. Um, here now from Matthew's gospel, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Inspired words for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It has been said that the first commandment of the New Testament is repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And if that's true, that the New Testament's first command is repent, it would explain our church's preoccupation with the doctrine of original sin. Not our churches, of course, but too many churches completely consumed by everybody else's disobedience, sinfulness, and God's anger and damnation. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem with original sin, its origins through the church fathers, its perpetuation of shame and guilt, and the problems that arise from those places in our lives. It is helpful to know that there is such a thing as original righteousness capital O and capital R, our perfect state before what has come to be known as the first sin. Because there's nothing original about sin. We're created good. We possess the capacity for good, and we thrive in the good. Thank God. Because the world is scary enough. Our political climate is scary enough. Family, uh, raising children in uh, these days can be scary enough. And we need to know and be reminded that we are designed for good, to love, to be in relationship to God. And the church cannot be scary. We cannot afford to do any more damage or spread any more guilt or shame. That's why I prefer the prophets who paint pictures of providence and the calling that is on each of our lives. That's why I prefer the many stories of the Bible of fallible, dare I say, sinful humans who are chosen to do God's work. Because God's prophetic work has healing and redemptive power. God's prophetic work has healing and redemptive power. Just like making music has healing and redemptive power. I think Bruce Springsteen is a prophet and infallible. No, just kidding. Um, like Dr. King was a prophet. And infallible? No. In the song, Adam Raised a Cain, Springsteen uses the complex biblical drama of Cain and Abel to scream and jam in screeching guitar and well, lamenting his relationship with his dad in cathartic rock and roll. I don't, I'm not a guitarist, so I don't know what you really call that guitar in Adam Raised a Cain. Anybody know what you call that? Uh, Cain and Abel are Adam and Eve's 
two symbolic sons. Cain murders his brother, denies his whereabouts, and is cursed by God from the ground. That's the story of our first family, right? Cast beyond their relationship to the creator, to the darkness on the edge of a garden town. Bruce, Bruce's lyrics read this way. In the summer that I was baptized, my father held me to his side. As they put me into the water, he said how on that day I cried. We were prisoners of love, a love in chains, with the same hot blood burning in our veins. You know it's never over. It's relentless as the rain. In the Bible, Cain slew Abel, and east of Eden he was cast. You're born into this life paying for the sins of somebody else's past. Well, Daddy worked his whole life for nothing but the pain, and he walked these empty roads looking for someone to blame. You inherit the sins. You inherit the flames. Adam raised a cane. No grace, no freedom, no mercy. Because the depths of depression will do that. Erase the grace, foil the freedom, mask the mercy. Anyone who lives with depression knows about the void and the emptiness, the sadness. Anyone who grows up in an alcoholic household knows the fear and the uncertainty and the shame. And surrounded by the church with all of its promises, none of it really makes sense. Bruce describes his life in the church as filled with unknown bliss of resurrection and eternity and the unending fires of hell. A world where men turn into gods and gods into devils, and he knew it was real, he says, because he had seen it at home. He witnessed what he felt was surely the possessive face of Satan, and it was his poor old pop tearing up the house in an alcohol-fueled rage in the dead of the night, physical threat, emotional chaos, and the greatest power to not love. He describes his life as inextricably linked to the Roman Catholic Church. At first, he says, the priests and the nuns were very kind faces, what he described as all smiles and pleasant mystery. But come school age, when he was inducted into the dark halls of First Holy Communion, there was incense, men crucified, the curtained confessional, the sliding window of the priest, and the torturously memorized doctrine. He remembers walking to church in second grade, devising a list of acceptable sins, sins that he could spout off on command. He said they had to be uh, bad enough to be believable, but not too bad, so he didn't have too many Hail Marys to say. He writes of that struggle, how much sinning could you actually have done in second grade? With denominational loyalty at its lowest, there are people who identify as recovering Catholics. Some might be in our own pews, maybe we use that language, maybe we don't, but let's be honest. There is plenty of Protestant wounding. From bad doctrine and bad teachings about who God is and how God loves or not, with sin and therefore shame sprinkled through. I wonder if you recall a time when you wondered if you were good enough 
in Sunday school. I wonder if there's a time you remember that your sins were bad enough, believable or unbelievable. I wonder if you wonder about what the church teaches about sin or God's upset and God's anger. You know, our illnesses and our diseases can be genetic, therefore inherited, but sin, maybe, maybe. But we're very well served to remember that Jesus teaches us about inherited sin in John's gospel. In the narrative about a blind child, the crowds want to know who sinned the mother or the father, to which Jesus responds, no one sinned, period. That is not what this is about. We are healers for each other. We are doing God's work, work that is redemptive and life-giving. And so Bruce Springsteen frees himself through his music, and he frees himself from his home sweet home. Independence Day is that song. It is his own free at last, and the truth sets him free. Well, Papa, go to bed now, it's getting late. Nothing we can say is gonna change anything now. But I'll be leaving in the morning from St. Mary's Gate. We wouldn't change this thing even if we could somehow. Because the darkness of this house has got the best of us. There's a darkness in this town that's got us too. But they can't touch me now. And you can't touch me now. They ain't gonna do to me what I watched them do to you. I don't know, but it always was with us. We chose the words and yeah, we drew the lines. But there was no way this house could hold the two of us. I guess we're just too much of the same kind. So say goodbye, it's Independence Day. All boys must run away. All men must make their way come Independence Day. Bruce eventually realizes a profound compassion for his father. Whether it's having children of his own or a wife that was not letting him off the hook to get the help that he needed, the therapy that he needed, the medicine that he needed, he has insight now, experience, three kids. And he tells stories of moments of healing profound awareness of what his father was going through and a week-long fishing trip where they could sit by each other's side, toss the line, and be. Before his death in 1998, Douglas Springsteen was asked which of his songs he liked the best, which of his son's songs he liked the best. The ones about me, he said the ones about me. Because the bottom line is, these stories of scripture, these songs that we sing, some of us jam, some of us wail, are our stories. The scriptures and the people, the infallible ones, our, our story. We get to identify with the least likely being chosen to teach confirmation class or Sunday school or lead a mission trip or a committee, God help us, right? We get to identify with the least expected people being chosen and the healing power that we have in storytelling and song singing and remembering who we are. These are our stories. It's true that Adam raised a cane, 
But it is also true that Jesus has come to set us free. And it is the truth of our lives and our stories shared together that will set us free. Amen.